Stephen Chu defends the DOE budget proposal as Republicans rail about unfair treatment for fossil fuels. Also, a new study says the renewables industry can create a quarter of a million jobs, but only with an electricity mandate put into place. And the clean energy industry shows off its latest technology for lawmakers in Washington at Retech 2010. From the Energy News Center in Washington, D.C., this is the Energy Report with Susan McGinnis. And good afternoon. I'm Tyler Severs in for Susan McGinnis. Thanks for joining us for this Thursday afternoon edition of the Energy Report. This is a day of defense for Stephen Chu. The Energy Secretary appeared before the Senate Energy Committee today defending and explaining the latest White House budget proposal for DOE. Now, the Obama administration wants a 7% increase over last year's funding for the department. Also, there's a major boost to the Loan Guarantee Authority for the nuclear energy sector, a move that would triple the existing authority. And the budget calls for $4.7 billion in clean energy technology investments. That is funding President Obama said would build on the largest clean energy investment ever. That is the Recovery Act. Now, during today's hearing, Republican lawmakers pounced on the budget proposal, calling it unfair to the oil, natural gas and coal sectors. Another complaint from them, the proposal gives DOE a budget increase, even though the department has yet to spend all of its allotted stimulus funding. Ranking member Lisa Murkowski said that there is a disconnect between what the president promised in his State of the Union address and what actually showed up in his budget request. Last week at the president's State of the Union, he remarked uh, on, on energy. And uh, my take on it was it appeared to present a, a more centrist, kind of an all of the above uh, approach to the energy policy. For example, he called for increasing uh, support for additional nuclear energy as well as for oil and gas production. This was certainly a, a welcome change from my perspective, um, <clears throat> expanded beyond the kind of the renewable only mantra that we've been hearing uh, from the agencies. But with the budget request that we received on Monday, I already see a disconnect between last week's, speech, last week's speech and some agencies' budget priorities. Clean Skies Dee Bambani was at today's hearing and she spoke with Secretary Chu. You can find her entire report here on cleanskies.com. One of the chief complaints among critics of climate legislation is the potential job losses this bill would create. But now there's one renewable energy group that says a clean energy mandate could actually end up creating hundreds of thousands of American jobs. Today, the RES Alliance for Jobs announced its plan to boost clean energy employment by more than 250,000 jobs over the next 15 years. And the group says its study shows policy can create those jobs without first establishing a cap and trade system for emissions. A renewable energy standard will revitalize uh, a lot of, particularly the Rust Belt states. If you think about the automotive industry and about uh, how much that industry is hurting, those are exactly the skills and the capabilities that, that we need in order to grow our industry. So the impact is going to be very strong on those parts of the country that already have uh, strong skills, foundries, and the, and the ability to manufacture sophisticated parts for sophisticated machines. Now, the study we're talking about here was completed by Navigant Consulting on behalf of the RES Alliance. The report shows that a 25 percent renewable energy standard would create 274,000 jobs, many of those jobs, in states that have unemployment well over the national average. That job creation projection and also the RES percentage, that 25 percent, they are both higher than what is contained in either the House or Senate clean energy bill. Today, the ethanol industry is generally applauding the EPA finalization of the renewable fuels standard. Of specific interest here, yesterday, Administrator Lisa Jackson stressed that improvement in the calculation methods of indirect land use, as well as other impacts, they mean that corn can meet legal requirements for GHG reductions and can continue to be an advanced biofuels feedstock. With that in mind, today I talked with Tom Bias of Growth Energy about the significance of that land use recalculation. There's been this debate about indirect land use uh, for the past couple of years, what the impact is and how you really measure it. You know, there's, there's no uh, scientific uh, consensus out there that A, it's happening, and B, to what extent, and who do you blame for it? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, land use changes in other countries occur for a variety of, of reasons, for domestic consumption, for export, uh, and we have long felt that making an indirect land use change penalty only attributable to ethanol and biodiesel, uh, the science doesn't support it. 
My entire conversation with Tom Bias is now here on cleanskies.com. And by the way, he's a former senior policy aide to Tom Daschle when Daschle was Senate Majority Leader. You can see Bias's comments on the politics of ethanol issues. Again, that's all here on our website. Following the announcement of her decision on the RFS yesterday, Lisa Jackson discussed some of the data analysis that EPA used. And the administrator strongly rejected a suggestion that EPA had changed the science in this case to fit the politics. So I discussed that issue earlier today with a former EPA administrator, Christine Todd Whitman. It always does. <laughs> I mean, the thing about science is science is not exact. You are always going to be able to find a range within any kind of scientific analysis. Scientists, believe me, I wish they would have told me in, in various, at various times, you know, if you set your standard at 11, everybody 11% 11 per billion, uh, you know, everybody lives forever. That would have made rulemaking very easy, but they don't. They give you a range, and so within that range are several policy determinants, and that's the kind of thing that EPA faces all the time. Governor Whitman and I also talked about the latest White House budget proposal for EPA and the additional funding requested for GHG regulation in fiscal year 2011. Our entire interview, and it is pretty candid on her part, that's all here on cleanskies.com. Retech 2010 is now underway here in the nation's capital. This is an industry gathering for clean energy technologies. The conference is run by the American Council on Renewable Energy, ACOR, which is a familiar acronym here in Washington. Organizers say with more than 300 exhibitors, this is the largest grouping of clean energy professionals under one roof. And everyone involved here clearly wants to show Washington lawmakers just what can be accomplished with clean energy technology. However, they say that public policy has to lead the way. I think that in order to succeed, we need to have a renewable energy standard, and I think that in order to, to run the economy properly, we need to put a price on carbon. You can't hide the ball in terms of an actual externality that isn't reflected in the price of the energy that, that causes that externality. Retech runs through Friday here in Washington, and if you'd like a little deeper dive into this story, Clean Skies' Lee Patrick Sullivan attended the conference today. His story is here on our website, cleanskies.com. A bit of a mixed bag for energy commodity prices today. Oil took a bit of a nosedive behind a discouraging U.S. employment report. On the other hand, natural gas is up, despite the latest EIA inventory report that shows a lower than expected draw last week. Natural gas closing at $5.44 per thousand cubic feet. That's up two cents on the day. Oil settled at $73.14, down almost $4 in today's trading. And finally, overseas right now, the UK's electricity regulator is warning that that country faces power shortages by 2020 unless the government intervenes. Britain privatized its national power system in the 1980s, selling all of its generating stations. The regulator here, called Ofgem, warns that those stations are now crumbling and private companies aren't investing in necessary new generation. The group also warned that plans to invest more than $300 billion in green energy could end up hiking electric and gas bills 60 percent or more. Ofgem is proposing that the government set a minimum carbon price and then create a central buyer to guarantee a market for power from those costly new plants. That is this Thursday afternoon edition of the Energy Report. We'll see you back here tomorrow morning for our next newscast. In the meantime, you can send your comments and suggestions to us here in Washington, D.C. at cleanskies.com. The address is at the bottom of your screen. Contact at cleanskies.com is the email address you need to use. And a reminder, you can follow us along throughout your day on Twitter and Facebook as well. From all of us here in the Energy News Center, we're glad you're with us. I'm Tyler Suters, and you're watching Clean Skies News.